Hello, guys. Missed you last week. It's good to see you again. Good to be with you again. Um, so we're coming back to what would have been last week's topic. We're just rolling it forward. We're going to be talking about two-player games this week. Um, how, how are you all? Uh, I know, Michael, you went on vacation. Did you have a good vacation? I had such a good vacation. And I have the YouTube highlight reel to prove it. Uh, <laughs> we had a blast. I think I even got a little bit of sun. I'm a slightly... Slightly tanner <laughs> shade of face now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, and yeah, uh, Michael was asking me before the stream began if we're ready to use our special new Twitch setup for uh, Michael's Q&A game at the end of the stream today. And yes, we are. Uh, but it's a new sort of feature, a fancy feature. We've tried, uh, we showed you before some emotes, which you get emotes if you subscribe to our Twitch stream, like you get our special channel emotes that way. But for free, you get channel points and they're kind of buried in a different spot if you're not used to using Twitch. There's something sort of under the, uh, the window where you type or the field where you type your chat messages. Uh, and those are our spiel bucks, channel points. Mm -hmm. You'll see that just by spending time watching us, you earn them. And you'll also sometimes get a little pop up that says like plus 50. You get a bonus for basically actually being paying attention instead of <laughs> having it running in the background. Right. If you're if you see that pop up and you click it, you get like a bonus 50 points. And you can also click on that and it'll, it should give you a list of all the different ways you can earn channel points. But very simply, you can earn them by spending time watching us. And uh, we've made I've made three things that you can spend your channel points on, which are votes A, B, and C on um, the questions that Michael will give us at the end. So kind of start familiarizing yourself with that area. So when we get to that part of the show, you'll know what to do, but they, I made them super cheap. So if you've watched for any few minutes, you should have you should have 10 channel points and be able to put in your vote for yeah. A, B, or C. Yep. <laughs> like a couple hundred for showing up. So we want everyone to play the game. Yeah, just dishing them out. And what are those called again, uh, Heather? What are those, what are those called, uh, bucks? Our, ours are called spiel bucks. Yeah. Um, that was, that was coined that. by, we'll give credit where credit is due. That was coined by, by our attendee tanner simmons so thank you tanner thank you tanner yeah so we'll cover how to do that briefly right before the game later um but for now let's jump into this week's topic so two player games um we talked before about well there are games that play well at two player and then there are games that are only for two player mm -hmm. i think we'll mostly focus only for two player but i i think it's fair enough to mention examples of games that what even though they scale up um, particularly work for two player and maybe, maybe talk a little bit about why that might be, if we can think of some examples like that. Anybody want to go first? Thing, well, I, one of the first things that I want to point out is one of our earlier topics, abstract games. Uh, mm -hmm. You may have noticed that a lot, and I mean a lot of games that fall into that category of abstract games uh, tend to be made for two players, and some of them have mm. a historical context for why. Like there are mm. hundreds of variations of Mancala because Mancala used to be played by basically shepherds when they were grazing with their flocks and you would run into somebody with another flock from another territory and you'd be able to just draw <laughs> these line and scoop these holes and use whatever you had on hand for stone. Like all of these uh, chess, backgammon, a lot of these earlier games and then even more current games like that Yinch Shit series that I had shown a lot of them are based on and made specifically as to player games. Now, that's not the whole sum of them, obviously, but um, we probably won't be talking about abstract games as much since we've covered that topic. But yeah. I, I think it's fair to say, I don't know if the two of you would agree, but I, I think it's fair to say that a large portion of what we consider abstract games are specifically designed for a two-player tete-a-tete experience. Mm -hmm. Especially when I think of the parlor game genre, like the older games, the games that are in your grandmother's closet that all came out before 1950. I, it, a lot of those do feel like they are a versus one on one, whether it's whether it's chess or checkers or Mancala or um, cribbage or like it seems like games were made for two players classically, or they were a card game and it was four players and that was often a team's you know two yep. versus two. So that mm -hmm. it seems like that was the basis for a lot of games for a long time as well which maybe the deviation from the the one versus one 
game idea is part of what unlocked the board game revolution of the last couple decades. That idea that you could include more people in different ways. I don't know. I'm speculating. But yeah, I'd agree. That that seems to hold up. I, I remember uh, I, when... I would also... Go ahead. Uh, when I was a kid, the mixture of games that always intrigued me the most was Chinese checkers. And I just wonder if that was a... It was not a two by two. Right. You you yeah. could... I mean, you could play it two by two. Two, two a one on one or like uh, a two player only, but you could go technically you could go up to six. And I always found that fascinating. I wonder if it was a marker that I was going to become a hobby gamer. Yeah, I think I think that might have been a clue because that, that game stands out in my memory as well as a, an exception to the, the rule. Mm -hmm. You know, I, when we talk about two player games, I think obviously the common denominator among them is the two people, but I also think that there are, are a few. Um, I guess landmarks or milestones that we've come across for what we would consider more contemporary hobby game. And I think the first one has to give credit to Jay Tummelson and Rio Grande Games, who in the late 90s, early aughts, they were the company that were really bringing over a lot of the German games and introducing them to the North American audience. So mm -hmm. Rio Grande pulled over a lot. And uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about them later, but uh, through the the signature of cosmos rio grande brought over eight or nine different very very small box two-player games specifically uh so that these would retail anywhere from usually 14.99 to maybe 19.99 depending on the number of components very small slim consistent profile so they were easy to store uh, and we were introduced to a lot of german uh, designers that way and then I think another big milestone, oh, a, another category that tends to have a lot of two-player games are war games. So you had mm. companies that couldn't have large-scale distribution because they were about a very narrowly focused uh, thing. And so you would have companies like, um, let's see, Columbia Games or GMT Games that would build these war games that were oh. targeted to a very specific subset of the hobby gaming audience. And then, Does this fall into that category? I think it's a, a new evolution of that, but I'm talking about more of historical war games, like war games about the American Civil War or war games about okay. the campaign in Africa. Do you um, have an example off offhand? Um, Putting you on the spot. Not physically, but like, can you think of an example? Or just the hold Scots. it? Ha, there you go. But there Always are a prepared. number of games that I've played, particularly because I played a lot of games about the... Uh, American Civil War with one of my friends in St. Louis. That was a category of game that we know that we both could enjoy. He was an ACW buff. I was a game buff. So here was a Venn diagram overlap. Yeah, overlap. But I, I guess the other milestone that I wanted to mention is the pandemic. Suddenly when people found it harder mm. and harder to mm -hmm. play with others outside who might be part of their usual group, and for those mm -hmm. who aren't as familiar with or had to get ramped up to the online platforms like Tabletopia, I think a lot of people in the gameplay space have that one other person they can rely on, whether it's a spouse, a close friend, a roommate, or just somebody that through quarantine, they felt really comfortable and safe being around. That mm -hmm. I think that's another thing that made almost like this resurgence or renaissance of the popularity in two player games. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. sense. I have know several people anecdotally that have said they've really gotten into two player games with their, um, like you said, their partner, their roommate, their spouse, their sister, whoever, uh, over the last couple of years, because um, the environment that they played in has changed. Yeah. Well, I guess you, uh, uh, we share a little bit of lists of what we're going to talk about in advance to just make each other aware of what to get ready to talk about and kind of interestingly jay you didn't mention your own game <laughs> that is totally a certain kind of two-player game Which um <laughs> that's going play coy <laughs> no i i specifically didn't pick miniatures games like warhammer 40k or x-wing which i designed okay. um, or games like that because i think while yes technically they are two-player games i think there's a, a higher level of categorization for those as miniature games first and then two player games underneath that. But yeah, a lot of uh, miniatures games do 
technically fall under uh, the two-player category, even though a lot of people kit bash ways to make it a three, four, five, six-player game if they sure. want. Sure. But out well, of the box, a lot of these are two-player. I don't disagree with you, but I, it's probably partly experience-driven because I I had played miniature games before, um, not a ton, but a few uh, things like Scythe. If, if you, would, I guess that qualifies as a simple miniatures game, um, right? Well, you have you have minis in it, yeah? No, okay. Well, uh, I, I am the student here. But <laughs> what about? Uh, I don't, you... I don't play them either. But I think mini game miniatures games means you're recreating a large scale battle using miniatures. So there's some there's some time you're spending like measuring just like you're doing line of sight things. Am, am I getting that right, Jay? And there's nothing like that in Scythe. Does it have to be like that? Like with like, I know how Warhammer 4k works or can it be just like distance hex, you know, squares away like you would in D and D mm -hmm. or other, because yeah. Scythe does it fall into be. that category. It could anyway. be, but I think a, a big part of miniatures gaming is also being able to build. You'll get a point value or you'll get a mm -hmm. budget mm -hmm. that you can do to customize and build. I'm going to play an orc army and I'm going to select these specific units to play sure. against, uh, you know, Heather, who has decided to play an Eldar army. And then we bring our armies to the board and we have them duke it out. Um, gotcha. So some of them can be a little bit more free form where you're actually measuring. Some of them can be on grid. Now you've got what I think is definitely a two player game first. That's what I was going to ask, because it is kind of a miniatures game, but I think of it as a two player game because of how it's designed. And the thing that stands out to me about Star Wars Rebellion when I played it for the first time more than anything else was how intentionally designed the two asymmetric different roles were. There's the role of the player acting as the rebellion, and then there's a role of the player that is acting as the empire and they have different goals. They have different powers. They have un balanced powers and they have unbalanced goals so the uh empire is trying to do a harder thing which is to basically wipe out the rebellion while the rebellion is just trying to hide you're playing hide and seek a little bit stay alive but the empire has better resources better resource generation more mobility less weaknesses and it was just i'd never played a game like this where there was such a balanced game where either player had a, in, a seemingly very fair odds to win but the actual powers and and play and goals of the two different characters were so um, so different. And to me, it struck me that this would only work in a two-player game where you could take two things and set them um, consistently against each other. And, uh, and it made a big impression on me and, and my impression yep. of like hobby games. This is one of the earlier games that I would consider more hardcore that I owned and played. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. this is very different from Moncala where the goals are identical <laughs> and the power is identical. And the only, the only difference is who goes first. Um, and it introduced me to a very different way of thinking about a two player experience. So now that's a fantasy flight game. So there is a certain expectation of production quality as well. So mm -hmm. you've got top notch bits. Now, I, I think there's an argument to be made of, would you consider it the same experience if everything in there was just punch board? instead of having plastic pieces, if everything was flat and everything was two dimensional, would you still feel as immersed in the game, both the Star Wars setting, but also the action that you're doing, mm -hmm. if they didn't really pull out all the stops and make the investments that they do into production quality? So I certainly wouldn't have paid as much for it. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, I played with sticks and pine cones as a kid. So it depends on how active your imagination is. It absolutely helps, but I don't know that it's a requirement uh, for the experience. But regardless, I think it's a really good example of a excellent two player game. And apparently so is X-Wing. I've never played that, Jay, uh, but, I'll add it. but, but uh, I would love I the opportunity of, to. I hear a lot of people love it. Like when they hear about it, they're like, oh, that's the best game. <laughs> so, <laughs> you've got a lot of fans of that it, one. It's the game that I'm best known for, and it's the game that has the most, I guess, uh, split reviews on Board Game Geek. <laughs> like, really? You know, as many pages of very, very low-end reviews as there are more high-end reviews. And I'm very, very proud of the work. But, um, you know, miniatures games, I think, have enough different qualities that I don't put them in the same um category as what i would consider more broadly two-player games as a general overall category that makes sense well, that's so so what are some of the other two-player games that you guys wanted to talk about today well it, 
as an exclusion, Heather, if, if I could, kind of like I exclude miniatures games, I'm also excluding here CCGs, collectible games, living card games, mm -hmm. as much as I love Magic the Gathering, okay. and I do. And I play a ton of Magic the Gathering. Oh, because that's, that's, that's super, that's definitely a two player game, yeah. but I don't think of it as one. Uh, it's it's a one player game and a two player game because there's just as much play that goes into deck building before you ever bring that deck to the table. Oh yeah. As oh, there yeah. is in the strategy when you're sitting down to play against somebody. And a lot of people will play it solitaire as a puzzle game or to play out what a certain sequence of uh, opening turns might be or to solve. So while yes, Magic the Gathering ostensibly started out as a two player game, but there are other ways to play it. I still consider point. that that whole silo of games, like the Arkham Horror game and uh, the Star Wars CCG, a, a lot of the card games that Eric Lang has designed, um, the Game of Thrones one that were out, just like a lot of those, I still consider to be a different category of game first, and then within it, I look at the number of players who play in that. And you're talking about like, are you talking about the LCGs, the ones that? aren't collectible they're living card games yeah as you're saying some of those okay that because meaning that you'll get you know what you're going to get when you open the box unlike right. magic so you don't know what you're going to get when you box. open the box exactly yeah. so instead of a blind draw it's everybody knows what they're getting it sounds yeah. like that's also maybe part of why you're not including miniatures games because you describe like there is a one player game that you play before those games too right yep. of making your army similar yeah and that's uh, a good point. I've spent more time playing Magic by myself than I have with others, which is a sad fact I'm about sorry. my life. Thank you for highlighting that. <laughs> but I had a good time doing it. Heather, you were about to say something. Oh, well, just circling back to what you said, Michael, about how um, Rebellion is asymmetric. Mm -hmm. And I think it, I don't think it's absolutely true that only two-player games can do that. I think it's probably much easier to design and yeah. start playing a game that is asymmetric if it is a two player game but of course yeah. there are there's there there are not a lot of examples but there's vast and root um that are that everybody has a completely different goal uh but they go up to i think all, both of them go up to four players maybe five um yeah it's certainly easier to design i, a I game agree you know is going mm -hmm. to be a two player game for asymmetry um, well, and the more players that you add, the harder it is. Chaos yeah. in the Old World, another good example of extremely asymmetric play that really mm. only works with its player count of four or five with the expansion. Interesting. Well, and this is another, there? this is a new, it made me think of asymmetric because this one is asymmetric. You are either uh, the Nixon uh, administration mm. oh, or interesting. the press, specifically a specific newspaper. I can't remember. Which one does it say here on the back? Um, I don't know. You're yeah. You're the you're the press uncovering the Watergate scandal, or you're Nixon trying to cover up the Watergate scandal, and it's a, a mm. really. It's like not. It's been long enough. I think that it <laughs> long enough back in history that it's not too triggering to play this. I've only played it so far once with my husband, but we really found it interesting. I, I agree. It was his birthday present. So I agreed to be Nixon. I agreed to be the villain. <laughs> and... Twilight Struggle. <laughs> Talk about one of the top oh, 10 yeah. games ever on Board Game Geek, Twilight Struggle during the Cold mm -hmm. War. It's definitely a two player game. It's arguable whether that is a war game, but it is definitely mm -hmm. asymmetric. Um, so mm -hmm. two player games can be very, very light and simple and abstracted, like your Mancala and things like that. Or they can be very, very detailed, very gripping and take hours like Rebellion or like a Twilight. So there are uh, Twilight Turtle. So there are mm -hmm. lots and lots of variety, even within the two player restriction. This one is probably ultimately an area control game. You have like a one of those uh, cork boards that has strings over, all over it Ooh. and you're trying to create a like you're trying to create a path back to somebody in the nixon administration if you're the press and you're trying uh -huh. to block those paths off if you're nixon and so it's That's like cool. it's very thematic but it is not going to take as long or be as complicated it's not terribly complicated it's mostly card play and then the placing of these chips based on card play that's an area control sort of it, but you're not looking at a map. It is area control, I would say, uh, because you are 
it's it's very spatial and important the path that's being blocked or um, grown. But it's not. It's interesting that it's, it's area control without a map. It would be an example of that. So it's a good one to try if you want something that's asymmetric, but you don't want a big lift of a lot of rules to learn and stuff like that. Yeah. And if you're interested so, in history, because you definitely take a history lesson, it's like it's all really based in things that happened and real people. It's interesting. With a lot of the other qualities or game types that we talked about, not only do we talk about some of our individual favorite titles within that, but we were also talking a little bit more about like their place in, I guess, the hobby overall, or if you like this sort of game, you might like this category of game. What are some of the other qualities or aspects of two player games that you would want people to consider? Like Michael, for you, what are some of the most important things about a two player game that would give you a different experience from other types of games? Hmm. Like one idea that awesome. comes to mind, one idea that comes to mind um, in the asymmetric space, because we're there, I'm thinking about a game that I'm I'm working with to uh, to design with a, a co, uh, what is it, uh, with a co-designer of mine, uh, Jason um, Singerland, is it gives, a two-player game gives you, um, in an experience game, it gives you a chance to see things from the other person's perspective. And that's clearly not always the case, because again, games like Moncala or even uh, a more head-to-head -head game um, uh, like uh, like Magic, and we're not counting that, isn't about a story. But in a story-driven game like uh, like Watergate that you were just describing or the game that we're making, it, it lets you have uh, two um, either sympathetic or, an or antagonistic roles, and you get to think about things from the other player's perspective and your side. That's not where I, how I thought I would have answered that question if you had sprung it on me sooner, but that was something I was just mulling over whenever you were talking about it. Um, I want it to be a game that uh, that allows players of different um, skill level to play together, which I think that can be challenging. Um, with a, a big player account, you can kind of spread that out and add in more randomness and let everyone win or let someone kind of come to the top or it, people can gang up on the leader and uh, pull in a second place player. Your balance has to be really careful with the two player game. Um, but uh, but I think it, it's often the case that two people that are close and might want to play a lot of games together, like we were talking about earlier, um, are going to have different strengths. And one might be a more analytical thinker, and one might be a faster thinker or a faster reaction speed. And so you have to think about, or I look for a game that lets me um, play with someone and not have the same winner every single time, because I think that can get very stale. Uh, and I'm trying to think of different games that uh, that my spouse and I have played together a lot, or um, or my best friend when I was younger in high school. And it usually it was games that had that that um, that trait to them, where we couldn't wear it out too quickly because there were either new experiences to be had or new ways to win, so that it wasn't the same path every time. I, I think one of the things that, that makes me think of is when looking at a two-player game. I think people really expect value out of that—that that it's something that they're going to be able to play over and over and over again because it's so mm -hmm. much easier to find one other mm -hmm. player, whether it's consistently mm -hmm. with the same player over and over or to introduce somebody. Where if um, Twilight Imperium fourth edition, if that gets to the table two or three times over the course of its life, you feel like you got what you needed out of that game, even for the expense that it might be. But mm. for a smaller <laughs> game, especially if it's got a 15 to $30 price point, I think you're expecting yeah. that to hit the table uh, more frequently because there are more opportunities with that player count to actually uh, play that game. Uh, Heather, same question to, to you. you know, well, you're in a different situation since you play a lot of two-player games with Phil, but beyond that, what do you think of or what do you want out of the two-player game experience? I think when we choose to play the two-player only game, it's a special, it happens a lot when, or there are a lot of examples of them when it's like we're tired and we just want to play something that we already know how to play and it's not going to take too long because there's not very much time left before bed. Mm. Um, so like that, this is one that is, not all two player games are like that, that of course, but they're the ones that do that, I think are become popular. Um, and I know you had this one on your list too, Jay, but 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is an hey. example of one of those games that it's just a very simple rule set. And it also is, it's a pretty luck based game. So I could see people being irritated with, like becoming irritated with how luck based it is. But I personally, I guess I almost kind of need to show the cards to explain what is um, compelling about this to me is just, it's, you have to, the object of this game is to decide what of five expeditions that you want to invest into. So you probably don't want to do all five because you'll be out of resources and you just, you have to, it's kind of, it's kind of like quicks. If you've played quicks, you can only go up. Well, in quicks, it's to the right and it might be up or down, but this is always up. Um, you have to play the lowest card first. And yeah, so our boxes are different, but our cards are the same. And it's like the the this this is the expedition to the hit, hidden city in a volcano, and this is a seven, so it's like closer to the actual city. But then if you see the if I could find like, well, this is the investing in it heavily. It's not worth any points, but it doubles uh, how invested you are. So if you don't make it to twenty points, you're gonna actually lose more than. Um, so you, it costs you 20 points to get into it, to get into working on a pile and you need to put down cards of value that exceed 20 points if you want to actually make something out of it. And there is something about like just these nice big cards and the way the, the, the I, we, I think the way they did the art is super clever with the, you know, the actual place being on 10. Mm -hmm. This is the goal card and it, each one, they all have very, obviously very similar art, but um, it's like a progression of a story and was done really well, I think. And uh, that's part of why I like to play it. And it's just very, the rule, we can remember what the rules are every time we play. We maybe have to just take a quick glance, like how many extra points? If you, if you get to eight cards, you get the extra 20 points. Okay, check. And then we can just jump right into playing. Um, yeah. And games like that that are two player, I think they have... Uh, a strong place in the hobby yeah and i think it's been played i don't know if it's an exaggeration to say millions of times but uh brett spielvelt was an early online platform for playing games not putting games up to play test like we would see a tabletopia but lost cities and puerto rico were two of the first games that i remember seeing on brett mm. spielvelt back in the late 90s early aughts and there would always be requests in the lobby for people to play uh, lost cities uh, because it's easy it's quick especially with the facilitation of an online platform doing the math for you and doing the shuffling for you people would be knocking mm -hmm. games of that out in 10 15 minutes mm -hmm. and uh just cranking through those so it's a really good nightcap game like heather was mentioning there is some luck so if you feel that you luck was not with you it doesn't take that much investment if you've already got the game out to just shuffle up deal right and, right um, and you, you play uh, three, the way they mitigate that luck, I think, is you play three rounds. I mean, I don't know how much it really mitigates it. <laughs> Sometimes it can mean you get a really extra bad beating. <laughs> you have three rounds of bad luck in a row, but yeah. <laughs> I've thought of something else about two-player games that feels unique to me. You guys tell me what you think about this. But um, I think we uh, we often, there's there's a special feeling to playing a game where everyone already knows how to play it and you can skip that uh, rule book phase and you can feel like everyone's on fairly equal footing. That's a special experience in the gaming hobby. And that's a lot more likely in a two player game because mm -hmm. you, you already know how to play if it's a game, you know, um, and I'm sure there's exceptions to that. And Jay, you can dig into them in a second, but the, the place I'm going with this is uh, um, in, in games with take that mechanics or the opportunities to be gracious or helpful to other players versus to, um, to secretly play the villain and at the last minute pull the rug out from everyone else and steal the win, those work better in a in a game with multiple players where you might go play with a whole new set next time and people can't be as vindictive. But in games where you play uh, with the same person consistently, and Lost Cities is a great example, or, or any kind of game where you're likely going to repeat it with the same person, the two of you, develop a language around that game, um, it changes the way that kind of strategy works because people remember your past playthroughs. And so there is an almost legacy element to uh, some two player games, even though you start back from square one because there's a relationship between the two people that play them. Um, that's something that I've noticed at least 
Uh, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Have you experienced that before? That makes me think of this game when you say remember past plays, because this is one that this is one of the early games that we added to our collection uh -huh. and you'll see a theme. This is again, a card game that has just beautiful, delightful cards that make me so happy. Um, probably my favorite card art that I, if you just asked me um, off the top of my head, what it was, but it's, it's like, uh, it's about mushroom hunting, right? And morels are the most rare delectable mushrooms. And so there's only three of them in the deck. And there definitely is like, you always get the morels. I'm not going to let you get them. Uh -huh. again, yeah, there's, you know? there's like this past <laughs> game, take that, uh, that comes into play. I've experienced yeah. this with my family across all games where there was a, a period that I was playing games with everyone and they were just playing them when they played them with me. And so I, you know, I became the Monopoly devil who always won in, you know, in, in certain board games. And, and, <laughs> and there would be counterplay for that. That is really pretty. I love that art. Yeah, those are the morels. Uh, um, There's only three of them yeah. and you need three of them to score. So uh -huh. they, they create a lot of contention. Yeah, um, yeah. And this game is like, it has, a, it's called, the card mark is called the forest. And only it's because only two of you are playing as kind of the magic of you have to really, you're the, the first, the front two cards are the ones available to you for free, mm -hmm. but you can play foraging sticks to get, get deeper into the forest. Um, so you, there's a whole timing element of like, okay, that one, if Will takes the, um, they, they call it, what do they call it? The, uh, I want to say debris, but it's not the right word. The decay. So mm -hmm. one card goes into the d decay every time, and you're allowed to take the decay pile to get way more cards, but you have the hand limit is really strict in this game. And that's often what you're hitting up against. You can get baskets to increase your hand limit. But uh, yeah, you're thinking like, well, if Will takes the decay, then... Um, then it'll be those cards that are mine. But if he takes that, if he takes a card that's in the forest, those are cards of you mine. And you need to just like decide if you, and you can, um, you can cash in your mushrooms for not points to get foraging sticks. So there's that give and take of like, do I want to keep trying to collect three so I can actually get points? Or do I, I am I just, I don't think I'm going to get more than these two that I have right now for a long time and I want the foraging sticks so he can't steal the morels. But it's actually like a, as beautiful as the cards are. It's a very tense and challenging game, but yeah. I've added another game to my want to play list. That sounds right up my alley. And in, in both in game feel and in gameplay. It's and frustrating. I, I have not played that, but right before the pandemic hit i had submitted a request i i teach at university and i had submitted a request for funds to put more games into our board game library and mm -hmm. we got three copies of morels and they're just sitting on a box oh. in my office for like the last two years no. and i haven't been able to crack it open yet really excited to be able to actually uh give that game a whirl so they have day and night cards and there's one version. So like in the day, you know, everybody's out and the amount of mushrooms you're going to get is limited. But the, there's a one night card for every one of the types of mushrooms. And you get like twice as many mushrooms that way. And the first mm -hmm. time I ever played it, I got I was trying to collect these. And then I got the night card for this. I was like, oh, my gosh, happiness, joy. <laughs> This one has like a little, yeah, just surprise. Most of them are just kind of, you know, simple. Bland. It, the way it looks at night or okay. like, yeah. So I could show these cards all day. They just, I just love, they're, it's, it's, um, I think it's colored pencil drawings. Oh, that's a good, that's a good aesthetic. Probably by um, hand. Plugging two player games. Uh, one of the first, uh, game design, like, uh, what would you even call them? I guess hobby game designed. Like from a fellow game designer that I met, games that I bought was a two-player game called One Two Punch by Chris Williams. Um, mm -hmm. It's pretty active in the game crafter community, and um, it's it's a it's a boxing game. It's a you know kind of expansion on not quite rock paper scissors, but this counters that counters that, and there's a initiative order to the different moves, so you can get a jab in before a block, but a block comes up before a punch, and uh, it's a clever little uh, tight okay. eighteen card game. And um, and I really enjoyed that, and it made me think that uh, I, I do think that a lot of two-player games simulate conflict or combat um, in uh, in the real world. Like um, 
you know, a lot of contests of, of wit or physical fitness are two player in the real world. And so I think a lot of games emulate that, that in the two player space versus um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, more than two player games are, are not about um, those types of things. Cause I think a lot of, uh, a lot of sport and challenge is head to head and a lot of other things are not. So it, it feels to me like there's more two player games in that, type of theme i'm i'm more willing to play a game that is mean if it's mm -hmm. a two-player game i don't like it when i'm put on the spot to decide who to do a mean thing to but if yeah, there's like yeah. only one other person to choose it doesn't feel as mean it's like well this we're playing the game like it's not i have to do that you know what uh, i mean <laughs> it's a player it's a player type but i have watched players um uh, do equitable meanness in a in a multiplayer game and spread out their <laughs> their unkindness evenly across all players so as to not seem like they're targeting one person even when that's not the optimal play and then there are people who are the exact opposite oh. and being optimal takes priority and they'll deal with the social mm -hmm. consequences later uh, mm -hmm. but that's a really interesting observation because in a two player game it frees you up from that there's only one target and so you mm -hmm. can feel justified and 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 emotionally you don't feel like you're singling someone out boy that really depends for me because if the three of us were playing a game and i target all of my hate at michael then i'm essentially now cut it down to just the two-player game between me and heather right right so mm -hmm. you know oh i'd be hard pressed if, it would depend on the game and exactly whether it is a setback or whether it is a uh, real hindrance Right. If it's just a minor hiccup, that's one thing. But if it was a real impediment, that would be hard to come back from. That becomes mm -hmm. a little bit more difficult uh, to decide who is going to get the brunt end of one of those events or actions. Mm -hmm. Nations. Have you guys played Nations much or at mm -hmm. all? Um, I don't think a, I even know what that is. Is yeah. it is it a Sid Meier's game? I think it is. I can't remember. It 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 is a like a, a through the a through the actually am I thinking of through the ages because that's a different game. Oh goodness! Through, I think I'm, th I think I'm thinking of three ages. ages. I've heard of, yeah. Uh, yeah. But a Nations is a game that I own that actually has a lot of similarities. Um, maybe too many similarities, but in through the ages, um, the way that military works uh, can be a bit of a pile-on mechanic, like Jay is saying, where players are incentivized to pick one person and just beat them out of the game, basically, uh, put them in an unrecoverable position. That can be kind of hmm. problematic, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I've played that game in two-player mode, and in two-player mode. It's it it goes from being a, a problem to a really interesting game strategy because it's the contest is equal and you don't have to worry about one person getting the target of all the hate and basically making the game unplayable for that person. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting dynamic and it has to do with both optimal play and also with I think personality um, because winning a game might not feel good if you felt like you were a bad person doing it and that's that's yes. a whole separate conversation. But I know a lot of people that feel that way. And then a lot of that, people that can completely yes. disassociate and they're like, yeah. I'm not a bad person. My character is doing the thing. And so, <laughs> no, no, there's not a right answer there, but I've seen people very firmly in both camps. Yeah. That's what I'm saying when I don't like pile on games because it doesn't, mm -hmm. I don't even want to win. Like I don't, yeah. I don't want to participate. <laughs> it doesn't feel good to do the thing I, that I need to do to win. Yeah. And if you're not having fun in the game, then I, I don't think the game is serving its purpose anymore. It's interesting because I've played in a lot of games where I know going into it that everybody else's strategy is it doesn't matter who wins as long as Jay loses. Uh-huh. <laughs> I've played games like that too. Like I said, I mean, being the gamer in a family of not gamers. Yep. Yeah, it's not yeah. just that, but when I go to a convention, people want to beat the designers. So like oh, for when sure. I'm playing a game that I've been involved with, everyone wants to destroy me, and I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that doesn't bother me at all in those situations. In other situations, I'm like, come on, let me at least have a fight. <laughs> a little fun. Here, right? Yeah, because there's no, I guess if they want to beat the designer, I guess in some ways that's flattering. Maybe that's what takes the bite off of it a little bit. Like, oh, yay, like these people like my game and I'm able to give them this awesome memory if I let them beat up on me. So that you're kind of getting something out of it. Right. Oh, I don't let them. I do my darndest. But <laughs> right, right. The entire Good table is sitting down, going, <laughs> going down. There's really only so much you can do about that. Yeah. Retaliation. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I guess one that I just I want to call out because it's really it's an example of a very Euro-y feeling game that it's actually pretty meaty for the small box. It's Targi. Mm. Very popular option. Um, it inv- it's it's kind of a worker placement ish game, but the places that you place your worker are on the edge of a grid. And then you're able to interact with things in the grid based on where you've placed and you can't place across from each other. And it actually, yeah, it's pretty meaty and it takes a little while to play, even though it's a two player game in a small box. Uh, there you go. You set out the board, you're collecting spices and, um, you know, victory points basically is what you're cre- collecting. But um, that's one of our favorites too. That's cool. I think another characteristic that I'm seeing across these and as I'm looking at my own stack here is uh, two player games as a designer are a great place to start out because it's a little bit easier to see where things are balanced and you can get them done with a very, very small component footprint. Like, you know, you were just talking about a game that was 12 cards, 18 cards, Michael. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You don't need a lot to be able to play a two player game. Now, obviously you can to the extreme and go up to something like a rebellion or go to some of these extremely large war games. But for a lot of games, Lost Cities, let's see, it is a board and uh, however many 60 cards. Yeah. And that's we don't even use the board too. Yeah, <laughs> so. Board yeah. and 96 squares. And mm-hmm. you can really get a lot of bang your, for your buck as a designer with very, very few components. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that's valuable. So whether they are components that you buy or get from an online place like the gamecrafter.com or whether it's just you scavenge your monopoly and risk and, uh, you know, <laughs> clue game and, and pull yeah. some pieces together there, you can design uh, a two player game out of almost anything. I mean, Mikala does the same thing, a couple handfuls of stones and some divots. Uh, <laughs> and you can really make a lot of interesting decisions out of very, very few components and rules. And fewer play testers needed, too. Yeah, uh-huh. a lot <laughs> easier to find one more person to play test with than it is right. to find, you know, two to That's five play testers. Yeah. You had a couple others. Maybe we could hit really quick. Uh, Jay, I grabbed them. You said, well, you, you showed them quickly on camera i've never heard of this or this so uh again i it's just part of the series that rio grande brought over from uh germany like i said late 90s early aughts i haven't played all of these but did play a lot of balloon cup uh with my wife really she's a very tangential and light gamer she'll play some light two-player games and it's just a very simple breezy game about Hot air balloons. Let me make you larger. Being able to uh, position your pieces and arrange tiles and cards to be able to get your hot air balloons to rise. But uh, in addition to Lost Cities, my favorite one of this series is called Kahuna. It's an absolutely beautiful game where you are trying to connect the different islands in this archipelago. And one player has the black sticks that represent their bridges and the other player has white. So it's very easy to see. But what's really interesting if when you look at the cards, they do a great job showing you where on the map that piece is. So when you are looking at your cards, you can immediately see what part of the board it's in the way it's lit up. And uh, Mm -hmm. you're trying to connect seven of these islands together in contiguous spaces. And there are things that you can do to sabotage the other players' bridges. But this is a tight, compact game that had, yeah. when I first looked at it, I kind of dismissed it out of hand as, oh, yeah, okay, well, I'm just getting it because it's part of the Cosmos series. I want to have this whole series. Mm-hmm. Um, but once I played it, I was like, wow, there's really a lot more to this game than I was expecting. Um, so a lot of German designers, this was the first time that I had heard of them. Wolfgang Lutke and Gunther Cornett and uh, a, a lot of these that I had never heard of before, but also some Rainer Kinesia games as well. A lot of Wolf games. Um, so it was great because when a new one came out, it was almost a guaranteed purchase for me. Guaranteed purchase for me because it's the same 
small profile. You can see how these would easily fit on a shelf. And if they're going to have a price point between 15 and 20, 25 dollars, that's mm -hmm. really not that difficult for me. But it wasn't just these uh, Rio Grande and Cosmos with small publishers, but you know, Fantasy Flight Games, they first packaged their Rider Kinesia card game Blue Moon in this Cosmos line. Uh, hmm. And it had expansions that came out differently, but it originally fit this as well. And I started to see a few other publishers create games that followed this box dimension so that it was kind of seen in that same price point and in that same sort of, um, I guess, value spot or, or style, even though they weren't part of the official original Cosmos Rio Grande uh, line of games. What about this one you mentioned, Jay? So uh, I've never heard of this one. Columbia Games is really well known for using wooden blocks that you have to actually apply stickers to yourself to be able to play. And the wooden blocks have a different strength based on which part of the square is pointing up. So if hmm. I've got three pips pointing up, I've got a three strength unit. And hmm. every time I take damage, I rotate it 90 degrees. So now it's got uh, hmm. less strength. Different units might start out or have a maximum or minimum strength. But what's great with these is since they're cubes, if I zoom it out a little bit, from the red player's perspective, the red player can see mm. all of the information in front of them, but the blue player only sees the red backs of the blocks, yeah. just like I'm only seeing the backs of the blue player box. So think of Stratego pieces that you're actually yep. rotating mm -hmm. as the strength goes up or down. But it is an area control game with some events thrown in as well. Uh, about the British and the Scottish fighting over territory hmm. on the British Isle. And it's it's a fantastic, but clearly very, very much a war game using their distinct uh, one. And one of my favorites, too, is their fantasy adaptation, Wizard Kings. Because not only <laughs> did it follow the same kind of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, motif that you were familiar with, with these squares that get rotated based on their strength, but they sold individual army packs. So if you wanted the shapeshifter wildkins, or if you wanted the dragons, or if you wanted the orcs, you could buy that box of cubes separately and add that to your game without having to purchase the entire, like the core game came with two armies that you could play and have quite a bit of fun with, uh, but you could also buy extra maps and they were geomorphic maps. So no matter how you arrange them, they always lined up and fit. So, um, a lot of those are cool things. expansions yeah yeah really really clever way of doing it so i ended up buying all of those expansions over the years because once you have the core game each expansion was another 10 to 15 dollars uh, to mm -hmm. get your hands on so yeah those are uh things i've never heard of it yeah it sounds like they're kind of from the era before or the like the beginning of the time when hobby games were yep. emerging so you would get wooden blocks were the same precision now because we didn't have publishers, particularly publishing houses in China that were set to make these very, very fine custom pieces. So the sticker sheets were the most accurate things with right angles and very, very easy to do. And every once in a while you would get these squares that were a little bit off kilter, or a little bit different and wobbly, and you'd have to ask the publisher to send it back. But then the red that they send you doesn't quite match the red of the other ones. Oh, so, no. Yeah. Well, you know, uh... again, I, I talk about the late <laughs> 90s period a lot, but they did the best with what they had, which was mm -hmm. they kind of set the, the groundwork by the mistakes that they ran into and the issues that they mm -hmm. kept encountering with publishers is what kept allowing those publishers and manufacturers to get better at, all right, what do we need to do for quality control to make sure that we are consistently making blocks that look like this? Magic the Gathering, it's absolutely critical that the back of every Magic the Gathering card looks identical, that the colors are the same, that your CMYK sheets line up perfectly, because the most recent Magic the Gathering card needs to look exactly identical to right. the second or third release once they started doing their backs a little bit differently. So, mm -hmm. you know, precision and uh, refinement has been increasing and increasing over all the years where I think probably in the last 10 to 12 years, I don't know what other efficiencies we're going to see beyond this point until we start coming up with new style shapes and sizes of componentry. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that was a little bit of a tangent. That's it was a fun right. one. We, should, we better do our board 
uh, board gameizer challenge if we're going to do it at all because we're running out of time. So let's get into it. Well, since we're talking about two player, I'm assuming we're just going to lay that extra requirement on top of what we have mm -hmm. here for um, so theme. I'm telling you, you can do pride or frontiers, but up to you. You can mash them up if you want. So the so what do you think the chip pull system is, uh, Jay? I can also go to the link for it. Do you think you know exactly what that so is? A, a common way that chip pull is done is with a bag or blind area, usually blind draw, sometimes specifically a plastic bag that other things will be dropped into so that you are randomly drawing them out, whether they are resource cubes. You don't know which type of resource, but okay. the chits here would be actual cardboard chits that get tossed in that might represent resources or units or other things like that. That then once you have pulled them out, those tend to either be uh, units or resources that you can place on the board or the actions that you can perform during that turn. Uh, but otherwise, it's a way of being able to quickly randomize a large quantity of items and then add new items into that mix, give it a shake, and then you've just expanded that range very, very easily and uh, quickly. Okay, so with that, you have to get the most amount of resources. That's how you win. And this game must be stressful. I will, that's the greatest constraint I've ever heard. <laughs> that, that's hilarious. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm starting. I'm start, I have an idea in my head. I, I intentionally tried to go a different direction because I, we already kind of started thinking about um, uh, a theme for Pride. Do we want to try and do two here, or because uh, um, I, I intentionally tried to do one for Frontiers since I hadn't thought about that at all yet. But you also had a game idea. Can we just pitch both real fast? Because well, you already had something you, started. Please. Okay, yeah, be, be you, fast because I know I'll you got to get back to work. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, so this is just uh, as Jay was talking, I started thinking, what can I do with frontiers and the chip pull system? And I imagined a two-player game where um, where uh, Earth is exploding and we're in space, and so there are two parties represented by the two players that have to explore out into space and find a sustainable way for humanity to continue. And so that is a new frontiers. You're hopping from planet to planet. Um, and exploring a planet would be represented by some kind of chip pull system where you are taking things out of a bag and you've got a blind draw on what the resources are. A planet could be hostile, represented by um, like negative chits or, or tokens in the bag, or it could be beneficial resources. And um, and ultimately, the most resources, the the person that can generate the the most resources necessary for humanity to, to continue, be the winning player. Um, and uh, I was thinking that you could at any point stop your expansion or you could spend those resources to develop more ships or more ways to travel to new planets, you know, kind of push your luck kind of situation where um, do you want to take what you have now or do you want to spend it to expand and intentionally possibly find more? Uh, that feels stressful enough on its own, yeah. but I was thinking we could add something kind of like uh, if anyone's played FTL before, uh, it's a space game about moving from planet to planet and you're essentially you're 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 outrunning an unknown darkness or an explosion or mm -hmm. some kind of nuclear nuclear blast so i would say in addition to this um there's a timer pushing behind the players and if you lag too far behind or you fail to mine enough resources on a planet and continue moving then you get caught in the in the blast that's chasing you and you just flat out lose the game so there's a hard lose condition for players that take too long or fail to hop to the next planet fast enough. So that is my quick pitch. You want to add anything to that, Jay? Way of doing it. The, the things that I would probably add would be, uh, you get a certain number of actions per turn so that you can mm -hmm. explore, move, whatever. The more actions that you devote to chit pulling, though, the more chits you get to pull out. So if okay. that's going to be the main focus, we'll call that research or exploration. So if I commit my entire turn to that, then instead of just pulling three, I might be able to pull up five, six, whatever. Um, but then every time you explore a dead planet or explore a planet with Xenos on it, you have to put a negative chit, a negative event into the mm. bag. And then you get okay. to shake that up and pass it to the opponent and go, all right, your <laughs> turn. Well, that's like, <laughs> right? uh, so, that reminds me of Dinosaur Island, kind of. Well, okay, you don't Yeah, put, no, I see what you're saying. You don't put more bad stuff in, but like the further down the line, like mm -hmm. there are less good Crank. things in there for you to get. 
So you clank like does that. Thing. Yeah. Clank yeah, does yeah, that. Yeah, Where yeah. like a negative situation is not an immediate downfall to you. If you make noise, you put noise tokens into mm -hmm. the bag, increasing the odds of the dragon waking later. But it's not an immediate payoff. I like that system a lot, and I haven't seen that in a lot of games. Mm -hmm. uh, th those are great ads. Phoebes does it by every time you pull a treasure out of the track, you're reducing the total number of treasure and increasing the number of dirt, which are empty, blank, dead poles. Um, mm -hmm. So there, are, that's a good way mm -hmm. to create stress is not only the what am I going to get this round, but the decreasing odds or the greater risk of going bust yeah. uh, is, is a fun way of being able to explore that interaction. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we'll, uh, I'm okay uh, looping back and letting Jay, you take a crack at it too if you want, and just putting the community questions on hold for this week. Yeah, um, I, you had a funny idea that we want to hear, so we'll show this again. <laughs> well, yeah. it, it wasn't funny. Actually, what I was thinking of, um, I'm not a member of the LGBTQ community, but when I thought Pride, that was my first thought, and that each color was associated with some sort of resource, whether it's a quality belief, uh, okay, or endeavor see, that they're see, going see. after. And then you are trying to pull out and create resources that are going to support each of these different actions and the stresses. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be able to okay. uh, represent all of these properly? I might be drawing a lot of red, which stands for or represents one sort of uh, issue, maybe political awareness, and I'm not pulling as much green. So am I going to spend my turn trying to draw more and more green and do mm. that or maybe i get a refresh or a promotion or a conversation appearance pride day thing that allows me to populate the pull bag with certain elements in it to increase my odds for a, a later round so i'm giving a little bit of ground now which i think thematically <laughs> some people might be able to relate to in order for the hopes of having something more equitable occurring in the future where I'm able to get the resources I need to get my message across. Perhaps there are certain events that I want to play and I can only play them if I have a complete set of mm -hmm. all of the colors in the Pride Rainbow. And when that completes, I'm able to actually pay everything and get that event. And the first person to achieve a certain number of events uh, would win. But that would be chip pulling and has a little bit of resource management to it too. But I think the stress would, come actually not only from the pulling and management of that, but also from the theme. Um, because there are a lot of people outside the LGBT community who might play a game like this, and it might be the first time they're exposed to what some of the issues are that are really important to that. And further, if it's designed by some LGBTQ designers, and there's something in the back of the rule book that explains a little bit about the reasons for designing the game, and maybe some more of the ludography of other games that they've designed. Um, I've seen that done with uh, some black designers or other designers of color, but I haven't really seen that done with uh, designers from the LGBT community. And it could very well be out there, but it's just not something that I've been exposed to. As the player, are you picturing yourself as a member of the LGBT community or somebody who is uh, trying to run an activism push for LGBT I think with or without be being a member? Like, you could have different roles, such as somebody who wants to be uh, a supporter but doesn't know how, somebody mm -hmm. who is trying to organize something, whether it's a march or whether it's a petition or something like that, and they need to get so many votes, which would be the resources. Mm -hmm. So I think that you could have different roles that could reflect the real life roles of what different people are trying to do or how they interact with uh, the LGBTQ community. I think that's that great. And I'm super impressed with how fast you came up with. Uh -huh. I'm super impressed with how quickly you came up with the framework for that. Whenever we threw this up right at the beginning of the call, too, it was like immediately you connected shits, colors, tokens, pride. Um, <laughs> the only thing I would add to this is, can we do it in space? <laughs> well, can it we? Be the, it could be the I'm... the future colony. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Making sure that LGBTQ rights are taken care of there. <laughs> um, I think I, I think there is something that's always going to be just bursting with fun to me about the LGBT rainbow. Though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's why I thought of it as it, it. Yeah, that's interesting. Like how, like if you're really wanting to be very serious about the topic, I wonder how much the, like in the incorporation of the rainbow 
would allow for that or not. Cause I, uh, very early in my time, like getting, like having LGBT people in my life. I remember I had a coworker who I asked about the flag, like, why is it like that? And I'm sorry, I don't, they actually do stand for things. All the colors stand for things. Um, and he lists them off to me. And I said, that doesn't sound specific to the queer community. He's like, exactly. <laughs> so my first little lesson from one of my coworkers about uh, the culture of LGBT community. Yeah. Um, and that right. was kind of a beautiful message, right? Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Very happy to. And thank you, too, for joining me this week. I missed you last week. I'm looking forward to next week. Uh, just for anybody watching this about our schedule, and you'll see this if you check our Twitch schedule, we're moving our evening streams to more or less every other week, making allowances for holidays and things like that. But this one will remain weekly uh, in the afternoon for all you friends over in Europe that you can hopefully join us real time sometimes. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you next week. I think you were reminding me, Jay, it's going to be uh, 3D pieces next week. Is that right? Yeah. Am I saying that right? Ooh, cool. Three-dimensional componentry. Yay. I have this game about Star Wars that uses... <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not oh, to recycle. No. <laughs> I know, All right. right? All right. You, All right. you guys Talk have a great week. Talk to you guys week. then. See you next time.